I'm so excited, Reed, uh, for this new segment where we get to turn the tables and I get to ask you some questions uh, related to the topic of the day. So last week, we spoke with Kevin Scott, such a brilliant technologist, humanist, and we got to talk to him about uh, both the sort of geography of jobs and AI and how do we make sure that tech is spread out equitably, um, but also sort of the origins of AI and how people are adopting this at different speeds. You know, you and I have been talking to experts in AI and we're so excited about what's to come, but a lot of people are just learning about it and there's a lot of skepticism. So I want to ask you a question about another uh, technologist who you are obviously uh, work closely with, Bill Gates. And he was very excited about AI, but potentially skeptical about this approach. You know, would this approach um, be able to give you the gains um, intelligence that we were looking for? And one of the things he said was, once we have a tool that could pass an AP bio exam, you know, that's interesting. That's a level of intelligence that I'm excited about. And so so I think you, Sam Altman, and Kevin Scott did just that. You went by his house and showed him this latest technology. Uh, they could pass an AP bio exam. So, so tell us about what was that like? So Bill obviously has been um, a great advocate of the importance of AI for years in advance of this current revolution. And part of it that he, you know, super smart guy, um, was saying, look, one of the things that's really important is to be able to have uh, knowledge representation of the world and so forth. And so he was initially kind of throwing out some interesting challenges to the large scale language model approach. But you know, one of the things that's great about Bill, he learns and updates uh, intensely. And so part of the dialogue was to say, look, if you could show that it could read a set of biology textbooks and pass an AP bio exam, then that would show that it would have sufficient knowledge representation, even if you can't point to the symbols in the computer that do it that would reflect that. And we're like, oh, well, we think we can do that. <laughs> so we went off, and as part of training GBD4, we did not train it specifically on biology. We didn't train it uh, specifically on the AP bio exam. We just trained it on the wide range of all textbooks and a bunch of other things. And so we arranged a, a dinner at, at Bill's house in Seattle, had you know, a, a stack of OpenAI people. Uh, the person presenting was Greg Brockman, a uh, set of, of folks around um, the uh, Microsoft. Uh, you know, Satya was obviously there, but some other executives like, you know, Rajesh and, and, and Charlie Bell and others, and, you know, Kevin, obviously. And we went through it. And we actually even had this, this woman who was uh, one of the uh, biology uh, exam Olympiads there to help, you know, kind of ask the questions and parse it and kind of evaluate what we're doing. And we started going into the showing the demo. And when I asked Bill at the end of that, I said, so where does this rank uh, in tech demos that you've seen? Uh, Bill said to me, he said, well, uh, there's only been one other that might be as good as this one, and that was when I was demonstrated the graphical user interface at, you know, at Xerox Park, <laughs> right? And so it's at least that, uh, if not even better. It was a epic room that I think we all felt uh, privileged and lucky, uh, fortunate to be in the room for. And do you have a similar? sort of tests now? Like, what is your AP bio exam? Is there something that you're like, man, if AI could do X, Y, Z, you know, today or by the end of the year that um, that you would be similarly excited for? Like, we're passing by these milestones. We're like blowing past them. Is, is there something you're excited about? There's a whole stack. Um, and they range from some things that are kind of more pedestrian, which is, you know, thinking about things like inflection and pie, which is can it remember a sequence of actions and execute a plan of being your agent out in the world? Like, hey, you know, I'm going to Rome, you know, book me a good tour of the Vatican Museum and, you know, that kind of stuff is a as a way of operating. Um, and there's a whole stack of stuff in that. There's also memory and personalization of remembering you and what matters to you. And so that's all. I think all this stuff will happen, but there's a bunch of things that are that will be important milestones as we get there in the development of it. Um, then there is a stack of things that we think, okay, you know, high probability of accomplish exactly when. Um, so, for example, a lot of what people are working on right now is reasoning and general reasoning capabilities because you know, part of what you see is you can break these things by getting them to 
um, they don't understand when they're making foolish mistakes like around prime numbers or other kinds of things and an and ability to kind of navigate that. And I think some more general reasoning capabilities, which will uh, improve capabilities for the cognitive industrial revolution. And then you get to the next level up, which is things that you have a good possibility to do, but they are uh, hard and will spake specific work. Drug discovery, you know, and other kind of, you know, biological sciences and so forth, which, you know, there's there's obviously good work going on with protein folding, you know, with isomorphic and, and Baker fold and other kinds of things. But there's also you know, going to be some very specific work that will make some amazing discoveries. And then the next level beyond that is, well, could it start doing things that basically, you know, we currently don't see a line of sight for doing, but could do amazing things? Like, for example, could it help us with the invention and creation of fusion power? Or could it um, discover, you know, new branches of mathematics or make some intersections between different scientific fields because there's so much density of information it goes well outside any even you know one genius's head but to multiple uh, people's heads and then pulling that together and that's unclear the probability of that obviously you go well but we're still increasing cognitive capabilities only a matter of time it's like well not clear because you could increase cognitive capabilities infinitely for the next hundred years and still not get that (laughs) <laughs> right. It's how you're increasing the cognitive capabilities. And that's one of the reasons why people frequently, both the proponents and the critics, are usually a little, can be a little hyperbolic and histrionic in either direction because they just go, it's increasing IQ. You know, and it's like, well, no, it's it's increasing set of cognitive capabilities, some of which already today are superhuman and amazing. And we will continue those. But like, you know, what set of it really depends on how, like, will it be creating new science or not, new physics or not, or other? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things we talked a lot about with Kevin last week was uh, geography. He, you know, he grew up in a rural area um, and obviously made, you know, made his way to Silicon Valley. And I have to admit, before I started working together with you, I don't think I really understood the magic of Silicon Valley. And I will I will admit that there is so much magic there in, in the network and in the helping each other and sort of the deep concentration of talent. Um, but I also know that you, you know, care deeply about equity and making sure that um, this these new technologies are sort of spread out evenly to everyone. So Are there certain like geographies, you know, city, state, county, international, where you you would like to see more investment made when it comes to technology and AI? Like, how can we spread this out? Is it geographic investment that's needed or something else? Well, there's a stack of things. I mean, you know, people obviously in the industry like to talk about network effects and regions have network effects. And by the way, regions have network effects like Hollywood or New York for media, you know, and there's these network effects because it brings in talent, it brings in all of the necessary resources for creating, you know, the next level, the next evolution of projects in this. And Silicon Valley is obviously one of the, you know, great lights in the entire world for what happens here technologically, but we're better off the more locations and the more places we have for doing this. And the way to do it is a little challenging because you do get you know, these intense network effects. Like if people say, I want to, you know, move somewhere to maximally create an AI startup in the world, Silicon Valley is a good choice today for that. But by the way, uh, London is not a bad choice. Paris is not a bad choice. And so uh, there's a a stack of things. And what you're trying to do is build that up. So some of that's investment in the area. Some of that's government policy. Some of that's like one of the things that uh, Macron has done very smartly in Paris that I think has helped with their AI thing is saying, hey, if you bring your technology experience back, Silicon Valley, other places, and come here, you'll have a tax advantage status for coming back and working here to try to bring talent back in and, and things. And obviously, when talent's there and can build and can build amazing uh, companies, global uh, capital follows. Uh, and you know, obviously, uh, also you need high expertise and, you know, uh, there's a bunch of great technical schools in France, you know, and obviously uh, also in London, Oxford and Cambridge and, you know, other places for this and all of those things play in. Now, the one kind of thing that I tend to always emphasize, and that's part of the reason I talked about 
Macron's genius gesture here is you always want to be building off the network. But how do you bring, how do you extend the network? So it's like, how do you make connections between Silicon Valley and Paris? How do you bring the talent that has learned a bunch of stuff in Silicon Valley and have company formulation in Paris? And so, yes, you want capital. Yes, you want investment. Yes, you want government policy. Yes, you want immigration stuff. Yes, you want uh, startup friendly um, to be able to take bold steps and 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 move things and and to make an effort at innovation without having to you know cross prove your possible innovation benefit you know 15 different ways before you do anything you know etc cetera, etc cetera. all of that's important but you need to be building on the network and leverage as much of a network as you can and you know i think probably the the first time i had that observation and started doing that was when i joined and helped um, a set of efforts in the UK. First, Silicon Valley comes to Oxford, and then Silicon Valley comes to the UK um, with Sherry Kutu in order to be bringing that network building, um, which brings a proxy of the strengths we have in Silicon Valley to help elevate other geographies as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I love it. So speaking of AI, you're always going to get people being skeptical. Uh, they were skeptical in the early days. People are skeptical now. Um, you are not as skeptical. Uh, what do you think is the most misplaced skepticism of, of AI and, and why? Well, as you know, I beat the optimistic drum very loudly because uh, every the vast majority of people think that they're being helpful and clever by articulating their skepticism. And actually, in fact, I think most people's articulation of skepticism is actually harmful for humanity and so forth. And not because they should they should be quiet, but it's like do the work to articulate your skepticism in a way that helps you build something that's good. The whole point is we're trying to get to a really amazing thing and we're trying to navigate our way there. And so the question is to say, well, what are the most important things that might go wrong? And what are the possibilities of how to navigate around those? So the question is, is, is talk to the people who are trying to talk about what to do about this and and help shift to here are specific kinds of things that you need to be doing. So the kinds of things that I advocate are, we have many, many years of this being a human amplifying technology. So the question is, how do we amplify essentially the right humans? It's like say doctors, educators, you know, entrepreneurs creating products and services, you know, et cetera, et cetera, to do great things for human beings and less for, you know, human beings who are being destructive, criminals, you know, cyber criminals, terrorists, rogue states. And obviously the engineer tends to be like, let's try to create the tools so it can't be used and for bad. And obviously guardrails and safety on the tools is good, but ultimately human beings, you know, it's like, you know, we don't say, hey, we'll just, we'll make the, the, the nuclear bomb self-determining about when it's gonna go off or not. We actually put it in selective hands. And that's an extreme example, but it's kind of like the, okay, what are the things we do to make sure that the, that the that the set of hands is in none of the critically bad and then as many of the good as possible. Another one is you go, well, you know, we're we're working very fast in building this technology. Are there any areas where, you know, we could possibly uh, be kind of putting a runaway train um, out there? But you have to look at what the what the areas of those possibility are. And so for example, you know, um, when people say, well, I would like to set up uh, the AI without uh, human beings in the loop in the following thing, you go, well, go look at Dr. Strangelove or War Games. Or, let's, let's, let's have relatively little, <laughs> right, like autonomous major systems completely controlled by AI until we understand what the systems go at a very high level of probability. That, I think, is a general uh, general goodness and a kind of a principle. And so, like, what are those areas that you should be cautious about? And it's one of the reasons why, like, for example, one of the things I've been doing over the last, you know, at least eight years has been, you know, arranging, you know, kind of 501c3s of universities and, you know, a Vatican working group and governments and everyone else to pull together you know, key leading developers, including a lot of commercial labs, to say, look, let's share information on how to make this aligned well with very positive human outcomes and how to avoid, you know, um, potential, uh, you know, destructive elements, whether it's humans using it or accidents or other things, by sharing that kind of information. But like safety protocols and awareness of, of how each other are thinking about it 
so they, they can challenge each other and say, hey, are you doing well enough here on what your even potentially social impact might be by releasing this technology? Have you have you done some red teaming? Have you done some testing, et cetera? And, you know, not surprising for you and other people who know me, it's a classic network think to increase probabilities of very good things and decrease probabilities of bad things. I love it. I mean, to your point about total network building, like it, it sometimes feels like these these camps are separate camps uh, and never the two shall meet and they don't talk, they don't speak the same language, you know, they both think they're doing the right thing. Um, so sometimes just getting them in the same room is, is so critical. Uh, Reed, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Aria, always fun. Possible is produced by Wonder Media Network. It's hosted by Aria Finger and me, Reed Hoffman. Our showrunner is Sean Young. Possible is produced by Katie Sanders, Edie Allard, Sarah Schleed, Adrian Bain, and Paloma Moreno Jimenez. Jenny Kaplan is our executive producer and editor. Special thanks to Surya Yalamanchili, Saida Sepieva, Ian Alice, Greg Beato, Ben Rellis, Parth Patil, and Little Monster Media Company. 